Welcome back to New Record Day. My name is Ron. If you are into two-channel audio, consider yourself an audiophile or music enthusiast. Welcome home. Make sure you hit the subscribe button and bell notification so you know when the next video drops. In today's video, I'll be continuing the Sapphire series featuring the Lampazator Amber 3 DAC. If you aren't familiar with the M3 Sapphires, they're an open baffle loudspeaker from Spatial Audio, which I'll be reviewing later this month. In the Sapphire series videos, the goal is to cover all the components I used throughout the review process in greater detail leading up to the M3 review. This will help give context to what I heard coming from each component and at the same time, answer a bunch of questions you guys probably have about getting the most out of the M3 Sapphires. And with a warm welcome back to New Record Day, that, my friends, is exactly what I'm going to do. One of the most common pairings we see used with spatial audio is today's show sponsor, anti-cables. And you know what? It's for a darn good reason. These wild looking cables, which technically aren't cables, are surely thinking outside of the box, and I use them exclusively in this rig throughout the entire review process. Even more, NRD is no stranger to anti-cables. They were one of the first reviews we knocked out as we started up the channel many years ago, and for this review we are using their anti-cables, their interconnects, and their power cords. Now, Keeping my integrity in check and knowing that Anti-Cables is sponsoring today's show, I'll set aside the hyperbole and I'll leave it at this. I do believe that cables can make a difference and I recommend Anti-Cables line up without any hesitation at all. And of course, huge thanks to Anti-Cables for sponsoring today's video. We certainly do appreciate it. The Lampazator Amber 3 is a digital to analog converter with an all tube topology built by hand in Poland. Taking design cues directly from their much pricier Pacific DAC, Lampazator redesigned the digital section and completely redesigned the power supply. Starting at $34.95, the Amber 3 features an entirely new tube complement consisting of an ECC99 super tube as an input amplifier and a zero feedback single ended triode mode, as well as ECC82s as a low impedance output buffer, which by the way is good news for those that decide to use transistor amplifiers with the Amber 3. Other notable highlights on the Amber 3 are copper output caps, CLC power filters with a 6x5 tube rectifier, and a couple other optional features at an upcharge. For one, the Amber 3 can be configured to be fully balanced, and if needed, you can even add a volume control if you want. Using the Amber 3 is simple. Near the back of the amp, there is a power switch by the mains input. Once the unit is on, there are only a couple of switches to get yourself familiar with. On the business end, there is a toggle for gain. I asked Frank from Lampazator about the differences here. He said that when the DAC is set to high, the DAC is running fully open, and when set to low, it's about a negative 6 dB cut. The purpose of this switch is to offer versatility with different preamps. For those who are curious, I preferred the switch set to low throughout the review process using the LTA Z10 with the M3 Sapphires. Next, there is another toggle switch which determines which of the digital inputs you are using. Speaking of inputs, the Amber 3 offers USB, optical, coaxial, and BNC connections. Last, on the front of the Amber 3, there is a button replacing the O in Lampazator, which in turn toggles between USB and what you have selected on the rear digital switch. All right, so in order to understand some of the things I've experienced with the Amber 3, we need to start with something rather unique about the M3 Sapphires. Yes, I'll tie this all together in a neat audiophile bow, but you gotta trust me, this is important, so hang in there. Most speakers, if not the vast majority of them, open baffle or not, have a crossover point from the mid-range to the tweeter, sitting between, if you are lucky, as low as 12 to 1300 hertz, all the way up to what we normally see between 2 and 3K. With that crossover point, depending on who designed the crossover and just how good they are at their job, there will almost always be some kind of a sacrifice. Whether that sacrifice is phase-related, directivity, horizontal, or vertical off-axis, and if those complications don't pick a fight with you, getting the two drivers to blend seamlessly together certainly will. Now, in the case of the M3 Sapphires, which uses a tweeter made of corundum, the crossover point is just below 700 hertz. Let that sink in for just a minute, and while that noodle is baking, let's crank up 
the broiler. What we're about to chat about is something I've discussed on my channel multiple times. And for those of you who have listened to my advice about pulling speakers away from your walls, I know for a fact you are going to be trekking with me as we chat. Past the fundamental hit of something, let's say a crash, we have the swing of the drumstick. And behind that swing, we have velocity. That velocity, which obviously translates to energy, creates the fundamental crack of the cymbal. With most typical mid-fi rigs or even hi-fi rigs where speakers are slammed against the wall, that's the beginning and the end of the roller coaster ride. And feel free to pick any instrument you like, including the sound of the room, where the performance is recorded, the same rule applies. Now, to make things even more complex in getting to the point I was going to make, if the crossover sucks, and even more, sucks up higher in the frequency band, that cymbal hit, or anything else in the time domain, is gonna let you know. I guess for you guys that like the sound of pots and pans clanging together, this won't matter, but for the rest of us, well, let's keep chatting. Ladies and gentlemen, where the rules can and are broken starts with the fact that with the sapphires, there is nothing in the way where that symbol hit happens. No chance for phase issues whatsoever. It literally doesn't and can't exist. Even more, there is nothing in the way of what happens after the hit, the decay, the shimmer, the bounce from the walls, which is where hi-fi turns from a recreational hobby to an entirely different experience that changes lives in a quick hurry. This folks, and finally bringing this back to the Amber 3, is what we call the time domain. And all things that happen within the time domain, whether it's the decay structure or spatial cues, are for me, the essence of hi-fi. As I promised, and finally landing this jumbo jet back on the Lampazeta runway, here is the takeaway. Everything I have really enjoyed about this DAC all lives in the time domain. Before we get to the good stuff, the Amber 3 being a tube DAC does add a lit from within character to the fundamentals, and that's to be expected, let's be honest. If we didn't hear that, Team Lampazator would have gone out of business a long time ago. While I wouldn't go as far as to say the entirety of the tone of the Amber 3 DAC sounds tubey in the sense of it sounds like my grandpa's tube amp, I would say it more like this. Everything that had sharp edges has been polished off enough to enjoy them. What was jagged now sounds a bit more smooth. What was thin now has a little bit more weight. What was dull now seems to have a little bit of shimmer, so on and so forth. I think you guys get the idea. And again, this is all in the fundamentals, meaning treble, mid-range, and bass, and for me, the obvious stuff I expect to hear from a properly designed tube DAC. But, like I said before, what I really enjoyed about the Amber 3 was beyond the expected, so let's chat about that for a couple of minutes. When I listen to the M3 Sapphires in my room, which is 16 feet wide, 20 feet deep, I have the M3s a good six feet into the room. Also, they are slightly wider than the typical equilateral triangle, approximately a foot wider, and the tweeters are pointing just outside of my ears. So, with the Amber 3 in the rig, what I appreciated is while I already have a wide and deep stage, thanks to both the Enios Zenith that we just reviewed, and speakers where they belong, which is out on the dance floor, the Amber 3 seems to have the ability to wrap all things I'm able to hear in the time domain with something I would describe as euphoric. It's easy to hear, and it's hard to describe, and if I'm being honest, I'm not sure if I could totally define it as natural or linear because that's not how I hear it. If anything, there is something sweet sounding influencing the decay structure. It's almost like, it's almost like seeing a painting of a sunset that looks a little more vibrant than the real thing. Perhaps it's just a dash more color or saturation in the painting, but either way, it can be satisfying. So yeah, the Amber 3 DAC is a kind of musical experience that will end any conversation that starts with all DACs sound the same. As far as I can hear, the paint being used to color the sound of the Amber 3 DAC is quite frankly prettier than a boring spec sheet, often used for boasting about how clean their latest chip is compared to the rest of the competition. As far as I can tell with my own two ears, while the Amber 3 DAC might not be completely neutral, squeaky clean, or even free of all distortion, what I am hearing sounds very pleasant in all the good ways. Even more, what's happening where the magic of hi-fi begins for me is quite frankly fantastic. So yeah, 
The Lampazator Amber 3 offers music with personality, and I'm happy to recommend this DAC for anyone that is looking for a little more euphoria in their digital life. And I'll see you guys in the next video.